Welcome to the Alpine Chapel. We're so glad you're here. There are, as the kiddos leave zero through fifth grade or going with Connor, um, there are some seats right here in front, right here if you want to. But uh, if you will, kind of make your way as kiddos find their seats. It's great to be with you guys uh, this morning and uh, great to worship the Lord together. Um, I heard there's like a little tiny festival going on this weekend. Um, any Festivarians here? Okay, a couple people joining. Very good. Glad to have you guys. Um, and uh, I, I also heard, someone told me that this is the time when nobody comes into town if you're local. So I'm glad you guys came into town. So thanks for coming to church and you found a parking spot and uh, we're really, really glad you're here uh, this morning. Uh, well, um, as, as we sang, we are um, here to worship the Lord. Um, let's see, can we turn that, I, as much as I could be like dramatic with that music, it would be awesome, but um, we'll turn that off. Um, we're here to worship the Lord and it's great to be and so, well, there we go. All right, now we're on. Here we go. Um, several uh, years ago, actually 10 years ago, uh, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to Israel. And when we went to Israel, it was a trip of a lifetime for many reasons, uh, just to be able to see the places where Jesus taught and, and to experience that. But one of the things that was really unique about being there is that it is the holy land for three religions. So it is obviously the holy land for the Jewish religion. Obviously, that's Israel. It is the core of where uh, Judaism started, right? And then it is the holy land for Christianity because it's where the church started. It's where Christ taught. It's, where, it's how the, the, the Christian church began. But it's also the holy land for, one of the holy lands for Islam. And all of that really comes into kind of play when you go to the temple. The temple of God that God created that as a place for his presence to be tangible, a place to be worshipped, a place to understand the holiness of God in the Old Testament, obviously is a very important place. And then as Christianity came upon, as Christ came, he taught at the temple, he, he began to help them understand what is this really about? What is the presence of God really about? But then also at the temple is the second oldest mosque, the Alaska Mosque. Um, on the temple grounds. And so when you go to the temple in Israel, you feel this tension unlike any other, this tension of Judaism, of Christianity, and of Islam. And, and as we were walking through, obviously a Christian tourism group, walking through the temple, on either side of us were these big groups of men yelling, screaming at the top of their lungs, Allah Akbar, which means Allah is great. And then these Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar on top over us as we walked through the temple. And one of the ladies in our group, she turned to our very fun-loving, lighthearted tour guide and said, I'm going to say, Jesus saves. And in that moment, our tour guide was not lighthearted or fun-loving. He was very stern, and he said, no, you will not. Because in that moment, you knew that something could easily break out. The tension was palpable. Centuries of tension, centuries of war, of division in this one place. And then we walked down the hill, and as we got off of the temple, we went into this little church called St. Anne, which is a beautiful church that has beautiful acoustics. And we, as Christians, we sang, Jesus paid it all, a cappella. And that moment was not lost on any of us. As we recognize what does it really mean that Jesus came, that he paid it all, and then he has come for us to die in our place, to allow us to have salvation that we did not earn. This summer, we're walking through the book of Ephesians, and what we've already seen as we've been talking through it is that God has chosen us. He has adopted us as children of God. As we saw last week, we were dead, but he has made us alive, that he has bought us with a price that Jesus paid it all. But one of the things that we can do when we start to think about that is that we can only make that an individual truth. It is absolutely an individual truth, that Jesus has paid our debt on the cross for us, and that we are now forgiven, that we now have the mercy of God, that we are now saved, delivered, and we have salvation forever. We are children of God. But the reality of what Jesus did when he died on the cross is not just an individual thing. It's also a community thing. It actually speaks to something about our very divided world. 
that what Jesus came to do was not just to buy us back as individuals, but God's grace and his reconciliation and his mercy not only impacts our relationship with him, but it impacts our relationship with one another. In fact, what Paul's going to say is that the gospel of Jesus is the only power that can actually unite us in here no matter what divides us out there. In fact, what he's going to say is that whether that's intense Jewish-Palestinian things that we now know even more about, that was 10 years ago, can you imagine now? Or whether that's things on, on a presidential election year where we may have different views on different sides of the aisle, whether those, those are issues of socioeconomics or where we live or living situation or all those things, whatever divides us out there, Christ has done something to unite us in here. And that's what Paul is going to show us as we continue in the book of Ephesians. In fact, what he's going to say is that Jesus, he, Jesus himself, is our peace. And he has knocked down all dividing walls all of dividing walls. And he has reconciled us both to God and to one another. Now, I don't know about you, but I can, I'm tempted to think that um, this is the most divided time we've ever lived in. Um, it's the most divided time in my lifetime. Many, many of us may say the same thing. Division, it seems stark. It seems like we almost sort of define ourselves by our divisions now. Uh, obviously, that's what drives media, that you know, ratings are driven by division and hate, the other. Um, and I can think, oh, this must be the only time in the world that was divided like this. But the reality is division has always been the case. And in fact, this book written to Ephesus, it's actually probably one of the most divided places on the planet, maybe even more so than our culture right now in Ephesus at that time. Now, in Ephesus, Ephesus was divided by class or socioeconomics very clearly in that city. The word citizen, as we've talked about, as we've looked at this, meant, meant something very important. If you were a Roman citizen at that time, you had all the rights. You had everything you needed. But if you did not, you had no opportunity. There was no way just to be good at a trade and to grow in that kind of situation. It was if you were a citizen or not. And in Ephesus especially, clothing, jewelry, and hairstyles uh, clearly marked out the status of people. So everywhere you went, you know, okay, certain people, if they wore so certain things, they were the elite class. They were the upper class. And then other people, if they wore certain things, they were slaves. Other people, they were slaves who had become freed, but they had to wear certain things as well. And if you were older, you wore some things. If you were younger, you wore some things. If you were married, you wore some things. If you were single, you wore some things. So it's just blatantly obvious everywhere you walk. It's kind of like when you see, um, you know, all the fur coats on the slopes in the winter, you know the Texans are here, right? <laughs> I can make fun of the Texans. I'm a Texan, so. But it's obvious. That's how it was in Ephesus. Everywhere you walk, everywhere you walk, you see, oh, that person's that class, that person's that class. It was the water they swam in. It's the water they lived in. Also, politically, the city was divided. Uh, they had statues with emperors and leaders all around Ephesus. But because there was so much turmoil and there was so much change, what they ended up doing is they actually took off the heads. They made the heads of the statues removable. This is a pretty good idea, right? <laughs> uh, you know, overnight, you're like, you know what? That guy's out. Take the head off. Put this guy. Put it on. I, I wonder, like, how many of these, like, statues of heads were around of, like, this guy's an up-and-comer. Let's build one just in case, right? He becomes a leader. Pretty efficient way of communicating. But it was so divided politically that they actually did that to make sure that, we can, you know, at any point you could communicate who was in charge. And then there was religious division. We talked about this a few weeks ago. They're not only that temple of Artemis, which had all the cult prostitution and the issues that came with that, as we talked about a few weeks ago. There was um, also emperor worship in that time. Uh, but there was a synagogue as well, uh, a strong synagogue, and a lot of Jews. And so you have Ephesus at this time, religiously, you've got this kind of merger of, of Judaism and of Christianity um, and of pagan ideologies. And so Ephesus, much like our time and culture, was defined by its divisions, and Paul says, Christ came to do something about this. And what he came to do about this is important. No matter how divided it is out there, we are united in here because of what Christ has done. So let's look at it. As we look at this and understand our time um, that is divided, how do we be the church in the midst of a divided time? So Ephesians chapter 2, 
We'll start here in verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made, by, made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And so this is where he starts. Now, what's he getting at? We have to kind of understand what he's communicating here. He's, spe he's speaking specifically about the religious divisions that are there. And so when he uses this word circumcision, circumcision was a sign that you were purely Jewish. So when he uses that term, he's using that as a way to, to determine these two groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And so what he says is that, and this is interesting, all the way for, through the first three chapters of Ephesians, there's only one command. There's only one imperative, and it's to remember. It's to remember. And when he says, I want you to remember who you were before Christ, he says, remember who you were before Christ, that whether you're Jew or you're Gentile, that you have to remember what you brought to the table when you showed up and what God has done for us. And so he, this enables us as we remember, as we talked about this week in our men's Bible study, this, it gives us this humility. When we remember that we did nothing, as we've talked about the last few weeks, remember that we literally bring nothing to the table, but God has given us everything that creates a humility in us. And humility is remembering who we were and where we would be without Christ. And what does that do? It's important because as we start in looking how, to, how do we interact with each other, we come from a place of humility. We come from a place of recognizing we're all at the same place, that without God, we have nothing. In fact, he says, he says, I want you to remember three things. You were Christless. You had no Messiah, no Savior, you were separate from Christ. He says you were foreigners. Remember this big focus on citizenship at that time. He says you had no homeland. You're homeless. And then he says this, it's kind of just to say, he said without hope, without God in the world. But he basically says that every single one of us without the Lord are Christless, homeless, godless, and hopeless. And when we start there, it creates a humility that we can have with one another. That there is no room for pride. There is no room for looking down on others. There is no room for this sort of spiritual entitlement. Rather, it's we are all people who have received God's grace. But there was these two guys, they were um, having a social media battle, which is now unfortunately a thing. Um, they were going back and forth over some political issue in, on social media. And just, it was getting pretty heated. They were arguing and fighting and kind of having this conversation. Again, never met each other, but all on social media. But they lived in the same town. And one morning, they both showed up to AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. And they were like, ooh, this is awkward. We're just going to kind of stay separate from each other. But when they get in the circle, as often they do at AA, is they start to share about their struggles and the challenges. And this guy was, was writing. He said, I was so convicted because I have this guy over here in a box, and I, I can just slam him on social media, and I can just fight with him all day long. But here he was in this circle telling me about his struggles and talking about his struggle with alcoholism, which was much like my struggle. And he's, he's going on and on. He's like, wow, I, I realized here I was thinking he's in this, he's this terrible person, and yet we actually have so much more in common in relation to our brokenness and to our humanity. And when we recognize that every single one of us, no matter who we are, that we were Christless, we were homeless, we were godless, and we were hopeless, it creates this leveling of the playing field and this opportunity to say, I can walk in humility. I can listen. You, might, you and I might disagree on something, but we can start at this place, at our fundamental humanity and our fundamental brokenness that every single one of us needs God. But as we looked at last week, thankfully, we don't stay godless, hopeless, Christless, and homeless. Look at verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jump down with me to verse 19. It 
So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. He says, once you were far away, but now you're near. Once you were strangers, but now you are part of the family. You have the rights as a citizen, but even more so, you're a part of the household of God, that you are a part of the family. And I think it's important for us to see how this happens. Look at verse 14. This is the one I alluded to in the beginning. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. What do we hear in that? That God has done something. He has made something new. And specifically, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. And and he starts by talking about the Gentiles who were hopeless and godless and messiahless and all of that. But now he's talking to the Jews. And he's saying that you also have no room for pride. There's nothing to do with the fact that who your family was or or your heritage. He's like, you have no room for that because all of us in Christ, the only way we're made new is because of what Christ has done for us. And again, I think this is tricky and challenging for us to really fully understand. But as a Jew in the first century, to welcome a Gentile in, they hated each other. They have centuries of being oppressed and beaten by the Gentiles, of being enslaved by the Gentiles. They have, all, they have so much tension. In fact, one rabbi at the time, he, he said this about Gentiles. He said, Gentiles solely exist to fuel the fires of hell. And that was putting it nicely. That's how they thought of each other. And so you can imagine this, that no one would ever imagine these two groups uniting. It would be like right now, having these Palestinian Christians in Gaza join together with these Jewish Christians from Tel Aviv and to worshiping together, no one expects them to be unified. But he says, Jesus has done something. He says, Jesus, verse 14, he is our peace. He has made the two groups into one, that God has made us one. And so here's what he's saying. For these pagan Gentiles who they thought they were excluded by their immorality because of all the ways they've lived. And for for the Jewish community, they thought they were included because of their family and their cultural heritage. He says it's neither of that. He says, Paul is saying to the Gentile, your past doesn't disqualify you. And he's saying to the Jew, your past doesn't pre-qualify you. And for some of us, we might need to hear that. We're walking in here, we're like, man, my past, I can't be a part of this thing. No, your past does not disqualify you. Or others of us who might go, well, I mean, I have all this religious heritage, so my past pre-qualifies me. What Paul's saying is, all that's wiped away. There's one thing. He is our peace. And how has he done it? He's made us one by deconstructing division and by reconstructing a new community. We'll look at that. He's, he starts by deconstructing division. Now, he says, he uses this line, he destroys this dividing wall of hostility. All the way through this passage, he uses this uh, temple as a metaphor. Uh, and again, if you think about the temple as a metaphor, the temple is the presence of God. And in the original temple, this is how it worked. There was the Holy of Holies. This is where the priest could go one time a year. This is God's presence, tangible presence. The next phase was the, where the priests would go. And the priests were sort of, of course, the most spiritual of the people. This is where they were allowed to go. The next court, there's walls in between each one of these. The next court is the court of Israelites, the men, because the men and women were separated. The next court was the women, Jews, Israelites. The final court, my arms don't go wide enough to go that far, was the Gentiles, the court of the Gentiles. And there was a wall in between each one of those things. And on that wall, written in every single language, was saying to Gentiles, you better not cross this wall with with punishment of death. And what is Paul saying that Jesus has done? Knocked all those walls down. He knocked them all down. He says, now everyone has access to God, to the holy of holies. Everyone 
because of what Christ has done, has access. He's deconstructed this division. And again, if you're hearing this as a Gentile, you're like, no, no, I always have to be on the farthest of the outside, but now I'm actually allowed in to a relationship with God because of what Jesus has done for me. And if you're hearing this as a Jew, you're like, no, 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 the Gentiles can't come any closer than that wall. And what Paul says is that wall is knocked down. And now we have something that is completely new. So he's deconstructed division, but he's also constructed a new humanity. And the goal in this was not to make these Gentiles more Jewish or, or vice versa. The goal was not one group invites the other one in. He says, this is a new thing. This is a completely new thing. There's emphasis in this on this word new. New, it has this idea of just completely unlike it was before. It's new in kind and quality. It's completely separate and new. It is the church. It is the people of God. He calls it a new humanity. One of the church fathers, he talks about how if you took a statue of silver and a statue of lead and you forged them together and, and they formed a statue of gold, not only are they one, but they're actually now better. Paul would say earlier in Galatians, he says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither uh, slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. This is what Paul is trying to say, that this church is the new community of people simply defined by their faith in Christ. We are reconciled to God because of what Christ has done for us. But we are also reconciled to each other because of what Christ has done for us. And so he says, how do we live in a divided world? How do they live in a divided world? We start by remembering who we are. We remember our brokenness and our desperate need for God to break through. And if he hadn't, we would be nowhere. It creates a humility among how we operate with each other. And secondly, he says, we have to remember that God has made us one. And so to put it bluntly, who are we to put up walls? If God has made us one, if Christ died on the cross, not only to give us forgiveness and mercy and grace and a new identity, but also to make us a one new community, then the last thing that we should do is divide. Who are we to divide what Christ has unified? Perhaps there's no better display of the power of the gospel, especially now, than having us, no matter what divides us out there, come in here and be united in our worship of God and our worship of Christ. Perhaps there's no better picture of the gospel than two people out there who disagree about whatever, local, national, global, whatever, but come inside and lock arms and say, we're in this together. We remember who we are. We remember who we were without Christ. And we believe that God has made us one. Unity does not always mean agreement. Unity is deeper than that. The idea in unity is that we remember who we are. We remember that we're connected by our brokenness. And we remember that we're connected by what Christ has done for us. Much like those guys in AA, when they gathered together, and they realized they could see their brokenness and they were connected that way. How much more in the church? The church is not defined by any political ideology. It's not defined by any racial or ethnic background. It's not defined by past sins. It's not defined by family heritage. It's not defined by socioeconomics. It's not defined by what you wear or a car you drive or where you live. We are united around the truth that we are sinners in need of God's amazing grace. Christ has made one new humanity. It's something new and it's something better. Any other defining factor, any, any other defining factor will cause us to divide and build walls. We are only focused on Christ. So what do we do as a church? Later, we'll talk more about this in chapter 4. Paul says, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. That we work at it. That what God has unified, we're diligent to preserve. We care about this. We listen to each other. We, we want to listen to understand. We want to remember who we are with our humility and so that we can engage with each other and even better be a picture of God's oneness. Uh, in my last church in, in Dallas, in the, in the height of 2020, COVID, political challenges, issues. This was obviously such a challenge. 
It, it, we all lived it wherever you were. I was in Dallas and, at the time. And I remember this one friend of mine, he, he has strong political views, still does, but he was so convicted by this reality. He said, you know what? I, I, yes, I have strong political views, and I might even disagree with you know, someone in my church, but what actually unifies us? And this radically changed his life. It didn't change his views, but it changed his life because he says, you know what? I can come in here, and I can lock arms with my brothers and sisters of Christ, and we can serve the church together, and we can be about the kingdom of God because that's bigger than anything else that divides us out there because we're united here. Now, I, I want to look at how Paul closes this little section starting back in verse 18. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So we've seen this. Through him, we have access to to the Father through one Spirit. Jesus is the one mediator. He is the only way. It's not our past does not disqualify us. Our past does not pre-qualify us. It's only through faith in Jesus that we become, we have salvation, and that we become one. He says we're members of the household of God. We're no longer Christless and homeless and godless and hopeless, we have access to him. But then he, he goes back to this metaphor that he keeps using, this metaphor of the temple. He says, because of the gospel, the way he describes it, we are the stones of the temple that build it up. And I love this imagery for a few reasons. One, because the temple, its primary purpose was to be the peak of God's presence. But look what he says in verse 22. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So where is God's presence? It's here. Where is God's presence? Where is God found amongst us as a new humanity in our unity in Christ? What he's saying is we're a temple. We're a tangible presence of God. So the stakes are high that we preserve the unity of the Spirit because this is meant to be a representative of God to Telluride and to our places of influence where we go, that our unity actually speaks to something. It speaks to God's presence. But I don't want to miss that the most important part of this whole temple, if you will, is the cornerstone. It says Jesus is the cornerstone of this temple and when I think of a cornerstone, I, I think of a, a church I worked at several years ago in Austin that has this little, it's, it's cute. It's like this little thing. It says, this cornerstone is the foundation of the building, but it's like this big. No, these cornerstones were so big in the temple that when Rome came to destroy the temple, they could destroy everything else but the cornerstones. And so when Paul says Jesus is the cornerstone, that this is the essential foundation to what this is, a, what we're about what we're building, and that union with Christ, that salvation personally, forgiveness, mercy, a new identity from death to life is simply because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, but also our union with each other is all because of the foundation of what Christ has done for us on the cross, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Part of the reason we take communion every week is It's an opportunity for us to remember as individuals what Christ has done for you and for me. But another part of the reason we take communion, the way we do it, is because it's a communal thing. When we stand up and we come forward, what we get to see is this unity around one thing, the broken body and the blood of Jesus and that we see that in the table in the ancient world was a metaphor for acceptance. That if you invited someone to your table, you're saying, I accept you, and you have access to me. And so with Christ, what we know because of his life and his death and his resurrection is that we have acceptance and access to God. We did not have that, but Christ died in our place so that we do have that. But then also, again, the, ta- the table is a metaphor 
is access and acceptance for one another. That together we are unified around the fact that Christ has died for us when we were hopeless. And he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So my hope is over these next couple minutes as we partake in communion, that it would both be an individual response, a recognition of what Christ has done for us, but also a corporate response, a recognition that we are unified, that we are one body, and that the stakes are high. It matters because what we don't want to do is build any walls to divide something that God has made one. So let's pray.